Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the ninth ECDA lecture of the hottest summer school in 2022. Uh, today is the third lecture of Anders Mortberg on cubicle ECDA. Thank you, Hubert. Um, all right, here we go. So um, I think this is the final ECDA lecture. So uh, I'll try to end with a, with a bang. All right. So, and also like uh, last time, feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. I'm very happy to talk a little bit, like answer some questions live. Um, it's nicer than doing a one and a half hour monologue. So, all right. So what did we do last time? So last time we had some, so some more inductive types, maybe with kind of a computer science -y flavor um, that stayed in the realm of sets. Um, and then I was talking about cubicle transport and how you can derive path induction from it. And then towards the end, I didn't really have time to go into homogeneous composition really in any detail, but I kind of gave the idea and then we ended. So now I'm gonna start off by saying some more about it and showing some of the kind of the things that looked very confusing last time. I'm going to try to um, make less confusing now. And then we're going to move on to univalence and this kind of cool thing that you can prove it uh, when you're working in cubicle type theory. And the thing you use then is something called glue types, which I'll say a few things about. And then I'm going to use that to do things with the structure identity principle. Um, all right. So good. Um, so uh, let's start with, uh, yeah more about H. Okay, so last time we had this uh, comp path operation. And I proved it using this um, funny H comp operation, right? Um, so we're building a path, so I can have factor over an integral variable, and then I need to make an element in A, which have the boundary we want, as usual. And I can do this in this case using this H comp, comp operator, which takes two arguments, um, something of a, with a weird type <clears throat> that I kind of quickly uh, said it was kind of like a list. I'm going to tell you more why it's what it really is. And then just an element of A. And as we remember, maybe there was this picture. I'm just going to paste it from my other buffer. Uh, so remember, I had this kind of drawing where in mind. So kind of the H comp operation takes in a shape like this. Um, this is the 2D version of it. So you have three lines like this. So one line in the bottom that I call the base and then two lines on the sides that have to match up with the bottom line. Um, actually. And the base, the bottom is the last argument here, T and I. And then the sides, um, so this is just a 2D version. One can also imagine like a 3D version where you have a square in the base and then attach four squares to the sides. So then you need more arguments. So this argument here needs to be something um, that essentially has an arbitrary large arity. So it's some kind of list of arguments that you plug in and then Angda checks that it makes sense for every one. And now I'm doing things. So there was this funny pattern lambda. There should be an automatic way of doing this kind of case split, uh, but maybe there is none. So anyway, um, so this was the syntax that I used, um, and I'm gonna motivate it soon and explain like what this weird lambda thing, weird pattern matching here really is. Um, Okay, but then like the idea is you put the base and then when i is zero, so the left of this drawing here, 
you put the thing I put here, so in this case, I put X. And it's with up my location. And on the right, I put Q of J. And the J I abstracted before putting in this thing here, which I'm going to call a system. So this is like a, a system of sides. And uh, this is. So <clears throat> that's kind of the more, well, one of the more, the simpler versions of using age comp. And like I said, you can do higher dimensional versions as well. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Um, so, oh yeah, before I, I do that, I think you can see this uh, YouTube, Hey, chair. So there's a cool video on YouTube that I would recommend everyone to watch called What Are Age Comp and Age Fill? Dash dash cube, people like that, which essentially um, shows a lot of the stuff I'm doing now without using ugly hand drawn ASCII pictures like this, but rather kind of cool. I'm going to mute it and then press play. And I hope you can see it. So it's kind of nice. He's typing here and the drawing pops up. and it looks very cool. So I think this can be quite instructive to see kind of what, get an idea about the whole uh, kind of geometry of what is going on. Um, but I can't really convey so nicely with my ASCII art, but uh, yeah, this guy is much better at graphics than I am. So it's really cool. So there is a link in the notes so you can watch it later. Um, okay, so I just wanted to advertise that a little bit. Um, Okay, but then you like, if you look at this, you might wonder like, why did I put uh, like the, the constant line, the referral line on the left? I could have put it in the base and have something like X to Y here, uh, Y to X here, and then Y to Y and then Y to Z, that's fine. Or I could have put it on this side. So there are essentially three ways, like uh, basic ways of constructing composition of two things when doing it in this kind of cubical um, way. So then like the more, maybe more natural notion of composition when you're in a cubical world, like composition of paths is a three, uh, like a ternary composition. So I'm just paste this down. Oops, that's... And just type it up for you. And then I can copy paste my brand. This. So what I mean is essentially this nice piece of art is what I want to make. So you can have this kind of, if you have a path from X to Y, path from Y to Z, and Z to W, you can kind of put them together in an open square shape like this. Um, and this is kind of the natural notion of composition, um, cubicle type theory. And this is a nice name. So in cubicle libraries, we call this very nice. I don't know how to pronounce this, but uh, dot, 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 oh, but uh, um, essentially like, Ternary composition, and I write it this way. Like instead of one dot, I put four dots. Um, essentially, to disambiguate from like having multiple dots. Anyways, it's this. So I want X, Y, Z, W, and I have my three paths, P, Q, and R. Oops, that's question mark. Okay. And to kind of fill this hole, I will essentially just plug in this shape. And the only difference is that I rename the sides and I put P reversed here. So simply of P here. So I'm just gonna comment this and delete the hole and type in the thing. Uh, Q, uh, this is RJ to the right, and then Q 
So when working cubically, this is kind of the natural notion of, of coefficient. Mm. And we can now agree group compact in binary composition, give it a nice domain. Let's just oops, where did I define it? Oh, it's in the cubicle field. I need to okay, good. So uh, essentially here you see the kind of um, yeah, it's this drawing again. Well, uh, it's this drawing again, but I put refl instead of p here, which uh, is going to be refl from x to x. So this is going to normalize to just x. So it's really this picture here again. So you kind of see, I guess, kind of a funny difference, I guess, from the, if you're used to simplicial sets in the simplicial world, you typically have a horn that, like to define composition, you just, like the natural shape is a triangle. So you just have, Two things that you compose in the diagonal will be the, the composition of the two things. But here, the natural kind of open horn shape is not a horn, but rather an, an open box or, a, or an open square like this. So in the cubicle world is a little bit different, but also similar to the simplicial world. So for those of you who know about simplicial sets and count simplicial sets, this is, uh, uh, yeah. The H-Con Corporation is uh, a cubital version of uh, lifting conditions for time complexes. It's kind of, we have some kind of cubical time complexes in the semantics, and it's a kind of syntactic presentation of the computation of the fillers. Or in this case, you don't get the filler, but you get kind of the um, yeah, that's some intuition. If you don't know what a kind of complex is, don't worry about this. It's just kind of a remark for those of you. Who it doesn't really help that much with like having knowing about this like kind of complexes and stuff. I don't think it makes a big difference when programming in cubical algebra. You can kind of just also think of this very syntactically as being an operation that takes some kind of and dimensional cubes and attaches cubes to it. Okay. Good. Okay, but I haven't really explained why this, what this weird second argument to H comp is. You might have seen when I typed it in a hole. You saw the H comp wanted some dot is one something something. So uh, I'm gonna explain that now. So, okay. Um, what is the weird first argument to H bomb? Really? That's the title of the next section. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the answer um, it's. And uh, yeah. Why do we pick the Y to Z path as the base for doing double composition? Does does it matter which one we pick? Uh, wait. Here? Mm -hmm. Wait, what would I have done otherwise? Sorry, no, I'm confused. Well, that's that's the question, right? A student asked, why did we pick that one as the base? Right. I mean. Uh, so what would we have put otherwise? I guess that's my answer. Like, um, like we want to have something like you have something from X to Y, something from Y to Z, something from Z to W. So you kind of need to make a shape that makes the like when you're composing things, things might have to match up. So I don't know if I put this randomly, put R here and Q there. I guess not gonna be happy because. Z is not Y. So Agda is kind of under the hood, checking that like when you substitute I1 for I in this thing, it matches up uh, with the starting point of this thing. And that would be, yeah, 
wouldn't match up. Now my drawing, it doesn't really reflect what I put there, but uh, you can see it. Anders, I asked, yeah. uh, I mentioned in the Q&A that you could do H comp with zero faces, and now people are asking about that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I would you call that. You should have mentioned that, Astra. <laughs> yeah, you should just, uh, I would call that an anomaly of the whole system. <laughs> Uh, that has to be there for technical reasons. Um, it also behaves differently in a type like the integers in the circle. It will compute on the integers. Yes. Or the yeah, natural at least. Yeah, I'm exactly. going to forbid MTH comps. Just watch yes. me. Yeah. Yeah, so you could put like something and you attach nothing to it. That is a perfectly fine thing. Um, it's not very useful for anything. I don't think it is really useful for anything, um, but it has to be there. You have to, uh, yeah. Well, we could disallow the user from being allowed to input such nonsense. Uh, but yeah, you can you can do it, um, but it's not, don't do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And a final question before you move on. Uh, is comp on zero sides the same thing as transp? No. Um, no, so, I mean, I mean, like the transport case of, of trans, like the cubical transport version gives you a function from X to Y. Um, what would you but, be transporting over is another question. Yeah, what are you I, transporting over? Like, well, I guess the, the question said comp rather than H comp. Um, oh. so I guess that is the same thing as transport. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, Modulo the empty system in the end, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, uh, that is uh, <laughs> some student knows too much uh, about this, yeah about this, and I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, but yeah. I'm happy to talk about it uh, later. Okay, but uh, for those who if you don't know what we're talking about, don't worry about it. This, this is, uh, I mean, when you're working in cubicle, like the H comp is what you need, but there's also you can also define something called comp, which is just kind of pretend mix. that it doesn't exist. Comp yeah. is gone. <laughs> it's, yeah. It does not exist. Exactly. So H comp and transpire your, your, your friends in cubicle like that. OK, <clears throat> good. Any other questions before I try to explain what this weird argument is? Uh, no, yes. And <laughs> that got really out of yeah. hand. Sorry. Yes, it does. Yeah, that's good. It's good. It's uh, much more fun to. Uh, Answer questions a little bit in the middle than just uh, rambling on uh, on my own. Okay. <clears throat> answer. Okay, so the answer is going to be long, but uh, let me do this. I like to do this when I just want the whole to play around it. H come up again. Um, so, what is the type of this thing? So it takes a level, a type, something called phi, but it's an element of the interval, okay? And then the weird, so the weird thing, uh, what is that? Phi, weird thing, something weird. Is it like that? So it's this type, okay? Um, so this is not too weird, except for this dot is one phi thing. And let me delete my useful zone. So uh, it's one. Oh, okay, no, let's do it like this. Sorry. I, uh, um, I haven't tried to explain this in a long time, so I'm going to do it this way. Um, so what is is one? Ah, it has the type, take something in the interval, okay, that matches what we had here, but then it gives us something in S set. This is not a simplicial set, uh, it's a strict set, um, which is some kind of fancy Agda thing. Like it's a kind of a, so you can define the H sets, but Agda also have some built-in notion of strict set. Um, but you don't have to worry too much about what it is. You can think of it as type essentially. Um, but essentially it forms a type um, and the type, so it's, one of phi that represents kind of uh, what phi equals 
I want. The kind of thing like this could be just a variable i, then it's just like i equals i1. It could be um, i or j, in which case this would be like i or j equals i1, which um, is true if i is one and j is, uh, j is one and so on, uh, or j is one. God, I don't know my Boolean algebra anymore anyway, but uh, yes, so i or j equals one if i is one or j is one. And this is something that is used to specify the sites of a queue, um, kind of a built-in Boolean algebra thing. And this lets us kind of specify arbitrary sites to arbitrary higher dimensional open boxes, uh, which sounds really wild, but uh, yeah. But that's what it represents. Uh, there's also a special term called one equals one, which is just a proof that I one is one, <laughs> which uh, just a kind of a, a special thing. And you could have thought this should have been refl, but the uh, refl lives in type and this is in S set and so on. So technical reasons, it's not just refl. Right one. Okay. All right, but so there's this thing which is kind of a predicate saying when uh, then uh, when an element of the interval is one. Like, uh, yeah. And using that, we can define kind of sub cubes or partially defined cubes. Um, and this is called partial uh, by A. So this is like a The type, the type of partial elements of A. Um, so the idea being this is like the, the type of fluids uh, in A that are defined or well defined, defined when uh, it's one. So it's kind of the elements of A um, that are only defined when this predicate is true. And the idea being like, if you have, I don't know, a square in A, so a map from I squared into A, um, you can kind of restrict it to any of its faces, and this you can do uh, by viewing it as some element under is one of, of five. Okay. Cool. Let me give an example. This, this probably sounds kind of bizarre and um, uh, very abstract. And I'm not too good at drawing. So let's find just an element of five. Oops. Anders, is partial yeah. phi a just a desugaring of what you have two lines above it? Um, yes. Or Are you sure about that? that? Answer i is one phi a. That's just, is that the same as partial phi a? Like this thing, sorry. Yeah, okay, I see. The question, okay, let me finish typing this thing before I answer the question, but it's a very good question. So the question is, and I think I said yes, but my answer was no. Uh, yes, I misunderstood. So it's partial. And this yeah, the same as this thing. That's the question, I think. Um, and the answer is uh, not exactly. Um, so the difference is that, like, this thing doesn't satisfy many definitional equalities, um, but when you're specifying kind of subshapes of a queue, you want like the order which you specify the sides, for example, should not matter. Or if you specify the same side two times or three times, and so, on. Um, so uh, that's the difference. So it's actually a partial. 
it's I'm gonna call it more extensional um, kind of, uh, elements equal up to permutation, replication, and so on. So it's kind of behaves more like um, yeah, a new okay. yes. So almost yes. Uh, technically, not exactly, because you kind of want the partial elements not to be dependent on the order that you kind of that you put this. So, so what I really mean is, for example, partial phi a. This thing would be the same as this. Definition the same, but if you view them as functions like this, they might not be definitional. Yeah, so that's kind of the technical difference. Yeah, good question. Uh, hey, let me yeah. interject real fast. Uh, if you if you ask Agda whether partial is equal to the other type, um, it's gonna say yes, but that's a bug. They're they're <laughs> not they're not supposed to be equal, and I'm gonna fix that. Like I have uh, a PR for that. I do right even now. know. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it thinks those two types are definitionally equal, but oh, no. that I is see. that is an actual bug, yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. I'm glad someone knows more about the internals of clinical lichens than I do. <laughs> I am anyway. cursed with knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> but, so how do we define an element like this? So we what did I do? put X there. And X is now a proof of is one blah 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 this and this is true like uh, whenever i is one or i is zero which means that so it didn't oops so i couldn't case split on it because i got isn't smart enough i feel like we should make this possible to case split but i'm gonna case this split. is also something i'm working on yeah but i'm gonna do it the manual way like yeah Okay, so imagine I did the case split for me. Um, that would have been cool, but uh, now I did it manually. Okay, so so there's this special syntax where you can kind of pattern match on, or not pattern match, you can pattern match on each ones, but you need to do it with this funny syntax, which um, happens to resemble what I wrote up here, right? So that's cool. Um, and yeah, false. So the good elements of bool. So this is some kind of funny um, element in bool, so to say. Or it's like a it's a line with the middle missing, but the two endpoints are there, and the endpoints are true on the left hand side and false on the right hand side. So. Uh, that's essentially what this partial element represents. While, like, we couldn't do the following. What should we do? Uh, like, I couldn't just type this. I think I said this uh, before. This I that won't be happy. Kind of split an argument of type non-data type I. So I can't write this, but I can write this. And here it's kind of yeah, it's different because it's under one of these is ones. Okay. Um, cool. And I think I got a question last week. Like uh, it looks like you're pattern matching on the interval. And now I've given probably a more detailed explanation why I'm actually pattern matching on the interval. I'm pattern matching on a proof that this formula is true. Uh, okay. This formula is true exactly when I zero or I one. Cool. Do another example. Um, prime. Just this formula, for example. That is fine, but if I would put I1 there, I could kind of be mad, I hope. Yes, not I is, is not I. Okay. Um, so 
Ida is actually doing something like it's checking that the formula we plugged in here. If you, yeah, it's kind of checking under the hood when is this formula one? And it's one when i is zero because if you, yeah, because that's negation one. Good. And yeah, the way I wrote this up here, I'm using a pattern matching lambda. So this would be um, like I can rewrite this as I don't know if you've seen pattern matching lambdas before, but now you will. And I should have probably kept the old code, but I can. You can, whoops, like that, blue. Oh, my buffer froze one second, but I can talk while it's frozen. So, yeah, anytime you're doing a pattern matching like this, you can turn it into a, kind of one of these fancy pattern matching lambdas. And I like doing it. That's in general, like that thing. So, the thing I wrote up here, it's not some special H comp magic, except for the pattern matching on this one here, but rather. And just a regular pattern matching lambda combined with a pattern matching lambda. Okay, so now I hope it's kind of clear what um, this funny first argument to H comp really is. You can. Stop me if you want, or I, oh yeah, I had a much more complicated example as well. I can do it. Or what did I do? Oh yeah, you can open for that. Something complicated like this. Uh, and then J. This is what I'm doing. You know, I guess it's gonna be, whoa. Now my buffer froze again, I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, ah, okay, so you can plug in more complicated things like this, in which case you need to give a bunch more cases. What cases do we have here? We have i equals zero, i equals one, and then, so when is i and j one, uh, that happens when i is one and j is one. And this, I think you can write like this. Ah, yeah. okay. My, uh, you can't <laughs> anyway, because well, the things you put here need to match up. Okay, but uh, yeah, so this is somehow what is going on with the second uh, first argument. Okay, so yeah. Um, Okay, so now I can give a slightly nicer. So where was the type of H comp? No, I didn't type it. Let me hold. So this is really, um, this part is really partial um, by, anyway. Um, okay. So that was that. Um, how am I doing? Um, um, yeah, I have one more thing here, but it's kind of difficult. Sorry, I just need to think what, what I'm going to do. This. Um, yeah, okay, I can say a few things about it. Um, right. So whenever I, I type this H comps, I keep saying like Agba is checking that things match up. Um, so, so before when I sw switched Q for R, Agda complained because things don't match up. And there is actually a way to specify this in the type of your operation. Um, and if you do a bit more complicated things, you're gonna need an operation called H fill, which essentially give you the filler of the whole open box here. Um, and in its type, we're using something to specify the type. Kind of precisely. 
Let me explain that as well. It's yet another kind of technical cubicle thing. Um, but it's good to see it because it um, yeah, explains things you see both in the cubicle literature and in the cubicle library. Okay. So yeah, let me just copy paste what I had here. Oops. Uh, I'm in my notes and just copy paste a few things. Uh, oops, I don't want to. Uh, you can comment, but essentially, in the cubicle library, we have this funny a bracket five maps to you syntax or definition, which means sub, which stands for subtype, which is a special kind of cubicle subtype. And an element of this type um, is a term of A when, which like whenever phi is one, um, is definitely equal to U. So that's the idea. And U is some element that is only defined uh, when phi is one. That's the idea. Uh, yeah, it's not the same here, I'm just gonna delete it. And because it's some kind of subtyping, oops. There is a bunch of, uh, yeah, uh, there, there is a map going into the subtype and a map going out um, like this. And if you look at the cubicle library, you're going to see a bunch of this in S, out S, uh, which stands for into the subtype, out of the subtype. So if we're given some U, like call a total element, that's kind of the opposite of a partial element. So it's like a normal element which is defined everywhere. Um, you can always view this as something, uh, yeah, a subtype of A, which on whatever file you plug in is definition. And uh, similarly, if you have a partial element, uh, yeah, you can project out of it, like this, out of the, the subtype. Okay, and this satisfies a bunch of equalities, blah, 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 blah. Um, but, the whole point of what I'm saying is that we can now actually give, specify in the type of HCOM, um, the fact that the sides need to match up. So let me do that. Then I think what I'm saying will be clear. So I'm going to define it on 8.5. Um, the sides and the base. Oops, let's do it this way for now. Let's see. Um, yeah. Okay, so what did I say? So when I said, like with my HCOMP examples upstairs, I said that like whatever you plug in for the sides needs to match up with the base. Um, so that was why, for example, if I put a Q here and an R here, I got complaints because uh, things don't match up anymore. So under the hood, Agda is checking like if you substitute one for I in this thing, you get this thing at zero. Um, so that's essentially Z and Z. Okay. Good. So let's specify in the type using one of these funny subtypes. Specify it here. And what I said was whenever the formula like that has to be one, that actually is one, the base has to be equal to the side at zero. Cool. And then the result of an H comp, let me scroll up again, the line here. So it's something which, um, 
whenever phi is true, um, matches up with the top part of the size. So the I1 size, I1 of the size. Let's copy this and put that in the type and this one. And now, like to prove this, I just use a bunch of this in S. Oops. In S out S magic. And Agda is happy because we actually gave the type that Agda checks under the hood for us. And you might wonder, like, why isn't this the type of H comp? Um, and the answer is just, it's kind of annoying to write in S out S everywhere um, manually. So, and there is no like, the subtype, the handling of these subtypes under the hood is not very automatic. So you have to be very, like it's no, no, not really implicit subtyping, it's really explicit, which gets annoying. So that's why we decided like the primitive H comp operation shouldn't have this super specific type, but rather the, the slightly underspecified type, and then users don't have to write in as of this anymore. Um, but yeah, good. But then like in the library, there's also this age fill operation. Um, let me just, instead of typing it because I want to move on to the next thing, but there's this, I'm just gonna show it to you. Yeah, essentially gives you a filler for the thing. The definition doesn't really matter, but it's kind of the interior of a, a cube. And the, the only point I want to make is that here we have to specify that the base has this specific type. The, 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 the very specified H. Good, uh, so that was a lot of technical stuff, I guess, uh, but uh, now I've essentially covered everything um, I wanted to say about how HCOMP works. Um, and this is kind of hopefully be helpful if you start doing things with the library because you're gonna see these funny things here and there and, and it's good to have PR, even if you didn't really understand everything I said now, hopefully helps because you know where you can read more about it. Okay, good. Um, any questions before I move on? To next? I think we're good. Um, all right, so that was a lot of stuff about HCOM. Um, and now I'm going to talk about which um, yeah, it's similar to, I mean, it's univalence like in Bukot, but because it's a, like we need to explain how it computes, like, well, cubic lambda needs to know how to compute with a term defined using univalence. There has to be something in cubic lambda under the hood which kind of explains how they should compute, in particular, how you transport in a path constructed from valence. And that's done using these glue types, um, which, uh, yeah. I'm not gonna say super much about, but the idea is, well, yeah, you're gonna see. They're kind of similar to what we do with HCOMP, but uh, instead of, attaching like lines or squares or cubes to another cube, you have some kind of line or a square or a cube in a type, and then you attach other types along equivalences. Good. So essentially it's like an H comp, but where the sides are equivalences. Okay, so, and yeah. So this lets us prove this UA thing that uh, we've seen. Before, so it's essentially one part of 
univalence is it's the inverse to the like the canonical map from from paths or identities to equivalences. And when you're doing things in practice, I would say this is really the thing you need because very often you prove that some two, two types are equivalent and then you just want to turn them into a path. And you don't really care about the fact that this is an equivalence and that this is an inverse to this specific map and so on. Um, very, very many examples, this is all you need. So that's why me and I also think Dan kind of introduced univalence using just this information. Okay, so, but I said this should have a proof, so we should be able to write something on the right-hand side here. So we are building something, type, which type zero is A and not I one is B. We can do this using one of these funny loop types. And the syntax here is similar to hcom, except the base comes as first argument. Oops, I need to give this Yeah, okay, get very blue and blue and yellow Swedish style. Okay, anyway, so, all right. So the base comes first, I put the base there. So it's essentially a line in B, um, just kind of constant line, that a line in, oh, sorry, a line in type, which is constantly B, just B. And then on the sides, we're gonna attach this equivalence E um, to kind of, transform the element from a B to an A. Okay. So what is the type here actually? We can ask it now. Aha, so it's an is one phi something sigma, but uh, yeah, and the sigma, so it's a type and a proof that, and an equivalence to B, okay. Um, Let me just do it this way. Which order did I put this? Okay. I put the, but it is the stigma type. I don't know why it's displayed so ugly. Uh, okay. You know what it is? So this has to be a type. I'm just gonna plug in A there. And now I need a, an equivalence between A and B. And B. But then I also need to give something on the right-hand side. And we're kind of done because we started with B and we glued on A along E to one side. And in the other side, I'm just gonna put B again um, together with an equivalence from B to B, between B and B. And, I cheated and defined it in we have the identity for the month. And some of you might wonder why I had to put the identity equivalence there. The answer is a little technical and I don't want to go into it too much. Essentially, the glue has to become fully specified um, in order to avoid weird things. Let's put it like that. But anyway, this is kind of simple definition that looks kind of like an H pump um, gives us a definition of UA. We have two questions that can be answered live. The first is that Lambda Doc noted that uh, the definition of equivalence in cubicle agda is contractible fibers, which is different from what we've been using in the rest of the course. Is there a reason that contractible fibers is preferable? Um, in this technical, like, um, yeah. So for, for us, there is, I mean, all of the definitions are equivalent, but depending on what you want to do, one definition might be nicer than others. And for us, contractible fibers is the easiest to work with because when you're explaining, so this, this defines a path, right? Um, 
which in turn means that we need to explain what transport or trans does uh, for path constructed using glue. And it turns out that in some place, the thing you really need is the contractibility of the fibers so that makes your life much easier. So that's why we have this definition as kind of the default definition of an equivalence. Is a map with and the other fibers. question is, uh, is glue really useful for anything other than proving univalence? No, not really. And there are very, I mean, you can grab for glue in the cubicle library and then there won't be very many, very many hits. I mean, we use it to prove UA and then we use UA pretty much everywhere. There are some examples where you can do kind of crazy things with higher dimensional glue, but that is mostly there for, for show, maybe. Like me trying or us trying to see if you can do things with higher dimensional glues, but really, for a user, you can use UA as a black box, I would say, and then we really don't worry about how glue types work. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, good un under the hood, HCOMP in type will use glue, but you, you don't have to type that in. That is actually not true. Yeah, that is false. <laughs> oh, it's changed? Uh, yeah, because uh, flag that has both glue and formal HCOMPs in the universe. OK. So then, in, in the paper, it's, uh, yeah, the yeah, H comp yeah. in type is defined as glue. Yeah, I guess, yeah, that is a good point, though. Like, so one of the mo like original motivations of glue was, I mean, of course, to prove univalence, but also to explain, like, how you transport, uh, like, if you do an H comp in the, in the universe type, that gives you some kind of weird age comp thing. And you need to explain how to transport in that. And you can explain it using glue. Um, so that was, that's what Carlo was going at, I think. But uh, turns out like you can optimize the evaluator a bit by not reducing transport in age comp in type to glue and just do something more direct there. But uh, that's really, <laughs> uh, yeah. going off on a tangent, but yes. Um, yeah, but uh, good, but so yeah, so don't really worry too much about blue types. Also, if you try to read about them in the CHDM paper, I don't think you will be very much wiser. It's kind of, kind of a complicated concept that is there to prove this one lemma. So don't worry so much about it, I would say. Okay, and then you might have heard, yeah. Uh, if glue is a primitive that's only used to define UA, why is it interesting that we can define UA instead of postulating it? Yeah. That, that is a, a question. That is a good question. Um, well, I mean, just postulating UA doesn't really, I mean, that doesn't give it any computational content, right? We need to write the right-hand side of the definition. Then, I mean, it could be that we don't allow users to write glue types. I don't know. Yes, there are some things that if you're an expert, you can do cool things with them, but I don't think like for non-experts stick to UA. Um, that's my advice. Hope that answered the question. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I, I think we're good. If there's a follow-up, I'll jump in again. Great. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I can talk a long time about glue and all that stuff uh, in the end after people want to know more. I just want to show you Is that the right symbol for equivalent? Let's see what I go says. Is that is definitely not the right symbol for it. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, never mind. The the bar was missing on my screen. Like that? Okay, good. All right, so, right. I think Dan said that, or maybe someone else said it, I don't know. I don't know. But I remember reading it somewhere in some earlier lecture that transporting in the path that you get from UA should really just apply the underlying function, underlying the equivalence. 
and this you can prove. Um, I guess one would kind of hope this to hold definitionally, but for an arbitrary equivalence like this within like arbitrary types E, it doesn't in cubicle ACTA. And the obstacle is if I normalize this, we get trans in REFL, really, this is a constant thing, but it's not for the REFL. Um, so it's really transport REFL of the thing we want. So there's a transport REFL in the way. But last time I showed you that, well, you can get rid of transport REFL using my, well, we can get rid of transport in REFL using my transport REFL lemma, which I'll just use here. And then uh, I'm basically I'm just going to paste in this. Okay, so so you can prove your a beta. Um, one might hope, what might have hoped that it would hold definitionally, but you run into this kind of problems with transport in REFL not being, not always being the item you function uh, definitionally. And you have to correct things like this. You know? But in practice, it's really a problem. Um, for example, for many types, Transporting REPL actually computes. Do it for a concrete type. Now, it's actually definitionally the same. So I can plug in REPL here. So for concrete types like that, like the natural numbers or some other closed normal type transport in reflection reduces definition of the side. So in practice, in many cases, you don't really need to fiddle around with transport refl, but when you're in the general case or for inductive, so well, parameterized types and so on, there, there are places where you need it. So, but in many cases you don't. Good. Um, Okay, and then here's this back UA plus UA beta implies um, univariant, like a canonical map from paths to equivalences is an equivalence itself. So this you can prove. It's in the cubicle library. It's written up in various places. I'm not going to go into it because, like I said earlier, like in practice, what you usually just need is Way. Okay, very good. Half an hour and a lot to cover, but let me show you some cool stuff now. Um, okay, I'm just going to show you like the first of all. Okay, before I move on, any questions about any of this? Because now I'm going to jump on to examples. Um, there was a question of, um, is it possible to know what the computation laws of UA are without knowing the intricacy of how mu computes? Um, yeah. Yes, well, I mean, you could just... You can kind of make sense of it by looking at, okay, what, what are the rules for transporting in, in just a specific blue? Um, the, the, the thing you get is easier than if you do the general case, of course. Um, but for technical reasons, we need the general case. So, yeah. I guess I could also say there is an alternative to glue called V types that are used in uh, partition cubicle type theory. Um, and they are somewhat, simpler to understand so if you really want to understand like how transporting new works you should you might want to first understand how transporting the three types that's like the yeah the the the, the UBC HL, hfl paper has no that does glue as well okay there are other there are some sources that it's i think the old red tt papers is that right yeah exactly the like the afh papers and, and julie favonia harper papers and, and so but anyway i mean i i think carla and i can explain it 
very well too if you want to know more about it. But anyway, um, if you want to understand glue, look at like how transporting glue works, look at this special case first. Nice. But if you don't want to really care how it works under the hood, don't worry about it. You can just use UA as a black box and it's tend to work messy. Good. Let me do like the, the some examples now. So, and just to show like you can compute with this um, nicely. So like the canonical example is the not the equivalence on blue. I don't know if you did this before, but it's uh, easy to prove that this is an equivalence. So how do we do it? Um, I'm going to do it this way. All right. So, okay. So you, I want to construct a path from bool to bool um, using like this not map, the fact that it's an equivalence. So I can just do that with UA. Now I need to construct an equivalence. And this is, you know, uh, a map and a proof that it has contractible fibers. And this is kind of annoying to prove. Luckily, we have a corresponding thing to Dan's improve lemma, isotope, which just takes an ISO, which is essentially four things, two maps, and section retraction pair. And if you don't remember what that means, you can just ask like that to simplify the goal for you. And you see, you need to prove that pro B and bool, not not of B is B. And this is very easy to prove. So the rem over mark. Because we ran, and if you, and here we need the same thing. So I'm doing this quickly because I think you might have already seen this, but you just pattern match and then it's rough. Okay. Now, the thing I want to show is like, okay, if I try to transport the not path, well, it's just increase the font down there. It evaluates to three. Uh, can you get the. Okay. I don't know. If you do same or not path, you get two, and so on. So, like, things work. That's good. This is maybe not the most exciting example, but uh, it's kind of very often. Uh, I guess this is kind of canonical. Like this is the most trivial example of uh, uh, showing that univalence actually computes the way you want. In the first lecture, I showed you the winding numbers, and they uh, kind of, yeah, I just glossed over how UA was defined because I just wanted to show that you can do things without going into the details. But what happens when I run this? This transport is really like all of this unfolds. This is UA, which in turn is a glue. So we're going to do transport in this, in some gnarly glue thing. And uh, yeah, then Agda is going to trigger the complicated function for transport glue and it's going to do some stuff to false, which is actually just going to apply that map. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, I'm doing okay on time. Um, so I had another example, but it's not as cool as I want to show next. So I'm going to skip it and move on to the structure identity principle. That's it. <clears throat> and there's a lot to say about the SIP. Uh, I don't know how many papers there are about various variations on it. Um, there is one version in the hot book, a chapter on categories. I'm not going to go into what that says, but essentially the idea is like univalence essentially says that uh, equivalence of types is the same thing as paths between types or identification of types. The SIP kind of takes this to the next level and says like any structure you have on a type, um, you also have on an equivalent type, so it's going to give you 
takes this one step further as into an invariance principle for equivalences. But anything you do in univariant type theory has to be invariant up to equivalence. Okay. This is many kind of cool consequences. And I'm gonna show you at least one of them today. So, I mean, what this kind of says is that any thing you do on one type, you can kind of transport it over to some equivalent type. And my, my favorite example is that natural numbers, which you can represent as unary or binary, and you can kind of do proofs on the unary side where it's easy and then run code over on the binary side where it's efficient. You know, transport results back and forth. So that's what I'm going to show you the end today. Okay, but uh, let me, like now I just set a bunch of things. Let me just show you also what it looks like in Agda. So I said any structure S, which is just like a structure on a type, is just a map type to type. Uh, and the equivalence is P. Then whenever I have an inhabitant of S of A, I should get an inhabitant of S of A. Okay. And yeah, you can kind of easily do this using subs. It's not the So this should be the predicates. In this case, it's just S that we want to substitute, and then the path is It's kind of a trivial consequence of UA that get a map from here to here. And in fact, you can prove that this is an equivalence. Um, Easy exercise in the notes. It's easy if you know that transport is an equivalence, which is maybe not so easy to prove, but if you assume that it's going to be easy. This is an equivalence. So that's what I meant when I said a kind of form, like a formal version of what I said. Like anything, any structure in univalent type theory is invariant under equivalence. Um, yeah, so in particular, for example, like, yeah, what could S be? So, uh, S could be a monoid. Is monoid, maybe we should say, like it's like is a monoid if it has you know a unit element and a binary operation satisfying some laws. Um, or it could be group or a ring or some other structure that you like, monad, whatever. Well, other types of fun. Anyway, uh, some kind of structure on your type. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, my example. It's good being well, it's not good being. Anyway, so for example, it's a monoid or a structure on your type. Um, I'm going to show you a great example of semi groups soon. Um, so. Okay, so this is useful for many things. Like, I mean, the SIP is useful for a lot of things. First of all, it's kind of a philosophically pleasing principle to have in your theory, like everything is invariant under equivalence, I think that's nice. Um, but also like it has many practical uses. So like it's a program with one type and two using another equivalent type. So essentially kind of, you can get the best of both worlds. So like if you want to do some proofs, you use unary numbers. If you want to do some computation, use binary numbers. So 
that's one application of this PSIP. So I'm not gonna write all the code about binary numbers here, but essentially you can encode them in many different ways. Um, there's probably gonna be one in the exercises. I'm not gonna write this as actual Agda code because I have it as well. You could go preload now, but we just, I, the way I encode them in the, in the, typical preload is either like a binary number. So first I represent the positive binaries and then I do, yeah, I add an a zero to it. So positive binaries are like either a one or you add a zero. It's kind of funny list thing, list-like thing. So, uh, X one x0 plus one that is uh, so this is what is it called is it little endian when the most significant digit is in the end so this is like uh, one zero okay this is a bad example it's so like one one zero one and by the it's thirteen i think with that. I should not try to improvise this, but uh, well, I think I did this the right way. If I didn't, you can laugh at me now. And I was very good. All right. Anyway, so this is the idea. You represent them like this, because then, like every positive binary has a unique representation. You would represent them in, yeah, like there are no, no trailing zeros, because the only way to stop is when you're at then by the zero or a positive number. So this guy, this is one way to encode them. Maybe not the best. Um, this is one way. I think I got this from the Cox standard library, but I might be wrong. But I think so. Anyway, so I'm doing them. Um, okay, so this is in the cubicle preload. I prove a bunch of things, and then in the end, um, I can. Okay, and. I prove it as an equivalence because that's what we need to use subsequent, right? So the turning, like it will get turned into a path under the hood. Okay. So I use my F2 quiv. And yeah. Um, it won't be very fun because I'm hiding all the details, but I think you can all believe me that uh, one can write these functions. Um, like write maps back and forth. It's kind of tedious, maybe a good exercise. I don't know how good it is, but it's an exercise uh, to do it yourself. Let's see this is equal to n to b into n. So I always call these like this. No, I don't. Shit. What? Okay. Oops. Then later. Uh, okay. This is what I got. Anyway, okay. So I approve all of these lemmas. You can go look at them if you want. Um, it's not super interesting, but try to do it yourself as well. But the point is, we, have, we now have equivalence of the two types. So the unary and binary numbers. Um, and we can use subsequent. So let's do that. I said I wanted to do it for semi-group instead of monoid because it's faster to type. So what is a semi-group? So it's just like a semi-group structure on a type A, or yeah, let's put it A. 
is just a binary operation that is associated. So, well, sigma, sigma, okay. Um, the operation I'm gonna go plus. I can just see that for so. And I use the fancy backslash colon four colon. Do I need to write it? Oh, maybe I need to write it. Yeah. And now I need to say that these are associative. XYZ. So this is typically how I write things. I, I iteratively refine things because I very often screw up uh, parentheses and stuff. Okay. okay, so here's the semi group structure on a type A. And okay, and it's easy to. Right. Proving that N is a semi, like we have a semi group structure on the unary natural numbers, that's very easy. So what do we take? We take plus and the fact that plus is associated in the notes or in the cubicle preload. All right. And now, finally, after all of that typing, we can do the substitute. We get the same thing. What the structure it can do. And here we need the equivalence. And here we need this thing. Oh, nice. So now we've transported this over. Looks good. Um, I can. I don't know, extract. So, so what happens now? So we have an addition operation and a proof that it's associative on the unary numbers. I transport it over and get an addition operation and a fact that it's associative on the binary numbers. So I kind of avoided having to write addition on binary numbers and then proving that it's associative. Um, this might not be what you want to do, but uh, it's kind of cool. You avoid writing a bunch of code. Um, good. And we can then just like extract this. All right, so you can just extract the operation and run it. I don't know. Uh, in pulse x zero x one plus one, let's just add it, uh, add one to this. this in put this parenthesis plus in in pulse pulse one. Okay, and so it's one zero one plus one. That's one one one. Yeah. So you see, it works kind of nicely. Um, like I said, if you get the second projection, you get the fact that this is this is uh, associative. Um, good. Now, so this kind of works. This example is maybe I mean it's kind of a simple example, but I think it's kind of illustrates the idea nicely. You can like it's it's easy to prove that addition on unary numbers is associative. But doing it for binary addition is a bit more pain. Um, However, um, this is maybe not exactly what we want to do because this plus bin operation that we get turns out to be very naive. So how does it work? Like, what could it do? We haven't told Agda anything about how to really add binary numbers the way we learn in, in school, if we learn it in school. Um, 
So Agatha kind of has to cook, they come up with how to do it by going via plus on unary numbers. What's gonna happen is take the two arguments, transport them over to unary, add them as unary numbers and then transport back. So that's really how this plus bin operation is, is behaving. And that's of course a very naive way of adding binary numbers. Um, and probably not what you want to do if you want to write run any serious like computations with this. So what you want to do is specify your own addition for binary numbers, and then just get the proof that it's associative okay, for free. And that's what I'm going to do now. But implementing binary addition by hand is a total pain. So I copy pasted it. And you will very soon see that it's a total pain. Let me just put this over. Okay. So, like with this representation, if you want to define addition, this is kind of what you have to do. Um, so, you need to have some kind of add with carry, and you need to do things, uh, many, many cases, and so on. Doesn't really matter exactly what I wrote there, just we observe it's complicated. So proving that this is like this operation in the middle here is associative will be a very, very big pain because yeah, we have so many cases to pattern match on. So no human should do that. Uh, luckily we have Agda. So what I'm gonna do now, scroll down. Wait, what am I going to do? I'm going to scroll. You can, you can study this while I figure out what I'm doing next. Um, ah, yeah. Okay. So, my, so what I want to show now, so like, oops. How to prove that plus B is a future thing. So, yeah, by hand, it was total pain. This we don't want to do. Instead, we want to somehow use the fact that we know that this thing, I need that, it's associative. So let's just give the name, plus bin dash answer. And I'm almost out of time, but I'm going to do this for now. And can wrap it up and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay. This looks very bad. I should not try to do things with as last minute, but uh, it looks like the numbers that are treatable. So I, I'm just extracting the second one. Okay. But I want to use this proof somehow to prove that this operation down here um, is associative. Somehow I want to relate this plus B to plus B. And it turns out this is surprisingly easy. You need to do a bunch of boring lemmas. Uh, I will talk about this soon. But then with some cubicle magic, you can actually prove that this plus B thing, um, the one I defined, the, the add with carry complicated thing is equal to plus bin, the transported one. And the proof is not so long. I'm not gonna try to explain it. I think the best is you try to uh, type it yourself and see what happens, but it's not so long. It's kind of an implicit use of funx for binary functions because we want to relate to functions and so on. And the key lemma, is this one that going from natural numbers, like if you do x plus y in unary numbers and you map it over to binary, it's the same as mapping to binary and then adding them as binary. So really that the map n to bin is a homomorphism from plus to the, like the, the fancy plus add with carry plus. And once we know that two functions are equal, it's very easy to get the fact that this uh, fancy one it's associated with the fact that plus bins. 
it's uh, the it's proof. I'm not going to try to explain it, but C plus bin S is here in the middle, and then I do some stuff on the slides. Proofs um, look very cubical. You can unfold them, or you can you can pipe them up yourself using equation or reasoning, and then they won't look as as dense. But um, it's really essentially doing a rewrite the disequality um, in this proof. Um, but yeah, so that was what I wanted to end with, just showing like essentially you can get the both of two world, best of two worlds. Uh, you need to do a little bit of work, like somehow you need to explain to Agda how the function you define, like the efficient function you define, how it relates to the the other function, and then and we have some um, more examples, and also okay, Maya Cubical Library has uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, well, convenient automation for making a lot of this, a lot of this easier. Like the stuff I did down here, you wouldn't really have to write if you use the library because, like, the only thing you have to prove is that this is some morphism, like a semi-group morphism, and then you just plug that into the library somehow, and it automatically gives you what you want. But I don't have time to figure out how you do that. But that's what we can do it, and like. You don't have to do things this way. You know? um, yeah, these kind of proofs you don't have to write. Okay. But I can talk more about that if people want to hear more. But I should wrap up now. So, uh, yeah, thank you for attention. And I hope you, yeah, want to do a lot of cubicle like in the future. Okay. Thank you, Andrews, for the lecture. That was great. We should all applaud and um, in chat. That would be great to thank Andres for the three lectures. So remember that there will be problem solving sessions uh, tomorrow and the last lecture by Egbert will be delivered on Friday. That will be the last lecture of the main track of the hottest course, although we will also have colloquia in the coming weeks with John Sterling delivering the first one. So I believe that I will now stop the